Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Charmaine Woodlow, and on behalf of Dean Mary Pearl and the entire Macaulay community, we like to thank everyone for being here for this special conversation on Juneteenth. Here with us today, we have professor and historian Ted Widmer, and we also have Dara Fry, who's she used to be our founding um, honors director at John Jay, and she is now the associate provost and dean over at John Jay College. So I'd like to welcome them both here today with us. So just to give you a little bit of background on Dara Bryan, um, associate provost and dean at John Jay College. Um, she's spearheading the strategic plan of much of John Jay College's undergraduate operations. Dara oversees offices, offices such as the Academic Advisement Center, Center for Postgraduate Opportunity, the Center for Career and Professional Development, the CUNY Justice Academy, John Jay College Honors Program, also the Macaulay Honors Program, the Math Foundation and Quantitative Reasoning, the SEEK Program, which is the Perry Ellis Sutton Program, and John Jay Ace Free Law Institute, the Student Academic Success Programs, and writing across the curriculum. So Dara really has a really overseeing a lot of the student activities and development there at John Jay College. And we're so happy that she's returning back to Macaulay Honors um, to join us for this conversation. I will also like to introduce our professor at Macaulay and historian, Ted Widmer. And I'm not sure if many of you know that Ted actually last year um, published a book on Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington. So he's a professor here um, at Macaulay. He's a writer, a librarian, a musician who served as a speech writer in the Clinton White House. And he's developing a new humanities lab at Macaulay. And I just discussed his latest book. So I would like to welcome them both so they can start this important conversation with us today. Thank you so much, Dara and Ted for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Charmaine. Great to be here. And happy Juneteenth a couple weeks late. <laughs> but it's a great time because we are a couple of days away from um, an Independence Day of sorts. And depending on who you are in this country and what your history is, you either celebrate Independence Day or you struggle with what independence means. So I do appreciate the timing of this conversation because we're between Juneteenth, which is um, a very important celebration for many people in the African diaspora. And it uh, sets us up for thinking about what really is independence and how do we come at the history of independence in the US. I so appreciated talking with you, Dara, yesterday, because you expanded my way of thinking about this in, in all kinds of ways, including the international way and your own background. And, it's, and that was a nice phrase. You just used the African diaspora, but um, with your Caribbean and, and Canadian perspective, yeah. it's a much wider story than we think of just in the United States. Yes, I, I think that, um, as I was telling you yesterday, one of the things that um, the, the national conversation right now around Juneteenth and signing the, the holiday into law is that it helps to add another chapter into the um, independent story. Um, where I come from and the former colonies from which my family is tied to, August 1st is an important independence day for many Commonwealth nations. Um, January 1st is an important independence day for Haiti and uh, especially for Haiti, one of the, uh, an emblematic iconic country in terms of freedom struggles. And now we have Juneteenth to add to that. And um, as I said to you when we spoke yesterday, as someone who is on her fourth country and, uh, and born in the Caribbean, raised in the Caribbean and Canada and has spent um, over 21 years in the United States, really understanding the ways that 
um, uh, black communities have fought for independence, but also how ideas about what freedom is, how you live with freedom from the pragmatic side through to the philosophical idea, ideological side is really, really important because right. we didn't arrive here as one and we didn't all get independence at exactly the same time. Oh, right. And I think the, the Juneteenth story tells you that just on American soil alone. So whereas in some um, parts of the country, uh, watch night service, um, as I'd mentioned to you, a watch night service in uh, certain black church traditions on the eve of, on, on um, New Year's Eve, many black churches held services and they still commemorate this to the day, waiting for um, the signage of the Emancipation Proclamation. Whereas in Texas and in many Southern states, um, uh, independence wasn't recognized until two and a half years later. So um, all of this is really important in thinking about the movement um, of freedom and how people developed into ideas of what they would do with that freedom. It's, it's been an amazing few weeks where, I mean, it, it takes a lot to get a new holiday created normally. And I, I remember the pretty slow progress for a while on the Martin Luther King Day and, and was finally signed into law by Ronald Reagan in 1983, but over a lot of resistance from his fellow Republicans, including Jesse Helms. And this thing just sailed through so fast and so happily. It just seemed like a, a holiday we all needed, maybe in part because of getting through COVID, but also it just was a really welcome story and I've appreciated learning more about Juneteenth. It, it also was kind of amazing from my point of view because a, a book came out at the perfect moment, which, you know, we all write books. We, we hope people will read them, but Annette Gordon-Reed's beautiful short book, Juneteenth, came out at the perfect moment for the, for the holiday. And you and I have been talking about that book and it really, e even in not a very long um, e format, in about 140 pages, she tells a whole lot of American history, including the story of someone who may have been African, probably was African, who was coming with the Spanish explorers way before 1619 in, in you know, the middle of the 16th century. So African history in the Americas goes back a, a really long time. And it just, I've just enjoyed the deepening of the historical conversation. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that one of the extraordinary things that we, you know, if we're lucky, we get to witness in our lifetime is when something happens with our um, national memory that coincides with the pulse of the people. They're not always one and the same. Right. And what feels like something that happened quickly, which for some communities may have been decades and decades of um, uh, writing and protesting and asking and um, being activists um, around, particularly making Juneteenth a state holiday and then moving it forward, collides with a moment where the majority of the nation is involved in a really deep conversation. And people are in all different places um, in, in that conversation in terms of their awareness, their awakening, a sort of reckoning with the past and how the past plays out in the present. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm an academic, so I know my historian colleagues, our humanities colleagues are having the time of their lives with this idea that people are really coming to grips with what it means to discover new knowledge and how that shapes the way we act in the present. And the signing into law is a reflection of that. It's what happens when 
people really take stock of uh, the truth of the past and decide together on what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm gonna throw something out here because I saw Dean Pearl's question um, in here about the period between June 19th and June 4th being an excellent opportunity to really um, reflect. Um, I don't know if anyone out here there has read uh, Charles Mills' Racial Contract. He's a professor at CUNY. And uh, he has a, a wonderful book, uh, The Racial Contract, that I think should be required reading for anyone at the undergraduate, graduate level, or any time in your life where you're thinking about these ideas of what the social contract is, what it means to participate in a community, to make a society or a civil society. And what he's essentially saying um, is that the social contract was developed around the idea of who the people were at a time when the people was rather limited. A really small, shallow idea of who got to determine what our society is. But the racial contract is talking to us about who was excluded and what that meant. And by virtue of excluding people, particularly on the grounds of race, there's also a sexual contract that talks about gender. And actually later on, they write a book together about this, but that's another story. What you get to really reflect on is how central racial exclusion and particularly racial hierarchies are to our idea of civil society. And this is what people mean when they say um, uh, white supremacy, um, either in terms of creating it or just benefiting from it. Because much of how we live our lives has been constructed around who has been included and excluded. And for the Juneteenth period, from Juneteenth to Ju July 4th, which is a wonderful suggestion, Dean Pearl, is to think about the, the distance between these two things, um, one that reflects an idea of independence about some people and, an, and the promise of freedom for those who were in captivity. And that's an extraordinary two weeks to really go deep into our understanding about our past and collectively think about what do we want that future to be because it's not yet written. And moments like this, creating a federal holiday rather quickly, <laughs> tell us the future is not written. And there's still something that people today can do to make justice possible and more inclusive and really rewrite those knowledges based on the truths of the past. Well, I, I love how you put that. And I, I really, appreciate the idea of a more than a day, a holiday is a day, but a two week period to really think about the distance between the words we quote back to ourselves about what a tolerant people we are and, and the, the problems we all know exist in this country. And a two week period sounds like a very good beginning and probably not a, a long enough period to, to meditate on the distance we have yet to go, but it it comes close. As a historian, I'm thinking about Frederick Douglass's famous speech on the 4th of July and how hard it was for him to just, un, in, in an uncomplicated way, celebrate the Declaration of Independence, knowing that its promises had been so difficult for him and his people to, to uh, achieve. So it's the perfect, it's not only is a two week time attractive, but it's the, the right time of year. It's when Frederick Douglass was, was writing that particular speech. And it, it also you know, calls to mind a little bit, it's a slightly different topic, but the Colin Kaepernick controversy over kneeling during this, the playing of the uh, Star Spangled Banner, which many people who didn't want to see a protest interpreted as an anti-American gesture. Mm -hmm. But I think what we are saying now is it really was much more complicated than, than that. It was an, a request 
to all of us to make our country better. It's a better way of saying it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think, um, you know, from what I have learned since um, being in the United States is that these are the things that are the most patriotic of acts. That's right. The belief that you can speak to injustice because there is a possibility of change. Right. Um, that is an amazing concept. And particularly, um, you know, in, in thinking back on uh, some of the uh, work that uh, Gordon Reed does in, on Juneteenth and many other scholars out there talk about in the period following um, emancipation, it's not as though um, the enslaved were freed and life just moved forward. In fact, Gordon Reed talks about celebrating um, freedom, the acts of violence that came as a result of um, newly freed Africans celebrating their freedom would be tortured, beaten, lynched, and so on. They couldn't actually celebrate their freedom. We could think about even in more recent times, uh, Muhammad Ali, we can think about the Olympics and all of these kinds of things where people exercise their freedoms, their liberties, their discontents, and were violently punished as a result of doing so. But yet, many citizens of all colors continue to express that discontent on the promise, the idea that that contract is for them as well. And I, I, there are very few other places in this world where citizens believe in that so strongly that they would risk their lives to continue to express their right to do this as any other member of yes. society. I mean, I, 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 I think it's an extraordinary thing. And when I look at even the last few years of um, who, who has been out there in the streets, as always, young people putting everything on the line mm -hmm. um, for that right to say, we are unhappy and we want you to do better. Aside from being inspiring, this is what um, American citizenship means to them and has continued to mean even for those who um, have been treated as half citizens. And, and I think it's an extraordinary thing that especially in this time period is worth really reflecting on how we get closer to that being um, something that you can express without repercussions like losing your career right. Um, right. And, and other things like that or life. One thing I, I really appreciate about this holiday, which we talked about yesterday a bit is, um, it's about the feeling of freedom, that there were a number of steps, including the Emancipation Proclamation in, in the period of the Civil War. There really were a lot of half steps and then some backward steps and then more forward steps, but it's not a simple linear story. And the the declaration that we celebrate with Juneteenth comes actually after what most people would say was the end of the Civil War. It's a little hazy when the war actually ended because there were still some roving bands of Confederate militias out there fighting in different places. But um, what's nice about this particular holiday is it's when the feeling of freedom was felt by Black Texans, it's when, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a decree by a general in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865, but it's when freedom really was felt by the African American community of Texas. And so what you were just saying about young people is so right on and we want our holidays not to just celebrate something that came from the top down, but how the feeling of freedom was was perceived at, at the grassroots level. Absolutely. You know, one of my uh, favorite young people at John Jay is in the audience right now. And um, 
the work that she and um, many of her peers have done in the past year has challenged me to think about and look at the world in a different kind of way. We, it's not possible to keep moving forward without making space for the lived realities of young people and, um, and room in addition to just space, but opportunity for the world to be shaped and shifted to suit the kinds of liberties and freedoms that they are choosing to express. And in fact, um, it's the, the, the hope of those young people that continues to advance questions of, of justice. I mean, you know, the, the things that um, some of the, the folks at John Jay, the students at John Jay asked me to do and to see in their curriculum are things that I never had in the curriculum that I learned from. And the idea that they would ask for cur curriculum that represented them, that they, that they could see the agency of their communities in the curriculum that was taught to them and that they believed that we, and particularly a predominantly white faculty could do it, is some of the most loving, it's the most loving act of justice that I have ever heard of. And those kinds of things, um, I start there because when I think about what Gordon Reed is conveying in this book is really a deep love of Texas yes. with the expectation that by um, living in Texas, striving for Texas, fighting for Texas, that it could be better. That this, this is the place that she learned her identity, that she learned her history, that galvanized her and inspired her to write the kinds of things that she writes. Um, on a last point, you know, when I went to, um, when I came to the U.S., I went to Howard University, the Howard University, for my uh, doctoral program, which is uh, a wonderful institution, and there I met a uh, cowboy boots wearing Black girl, a sister from Texas, who will tell you she loves Texas. <laughs> and I couldn't understand that because the Texas that I knew from television as a foreigner was the J.R. Ewing, Texas, as Gordon Reed writes, is a white man, is this sort of uh, Texas uh, ranger type of man. And here was this Black girl from the deep South who can tell stories of uh, a great grandfather being lynched that loved her state. And it's important really in, in holidays like this and the reflective period in this day of reckoning to understand what's in the soil of some of these places like the deep South where there are people of African descent who forged the land they developed the land, they have a right to the land, they gave, they fought, they lost, they won. But most of all, their understanding of what they want to see in the nation for the future and their place in it was born in Texas, was born in Mississippi and those kinds of things. And, and I, I have to say, it was an extraordinary experience for me to get to see how despite all of these very close um, experiences with racial violence still um, strengthened this idea and this uh, resolve that they were gonna get a better America out of America some way, somehow. And that's what I think is, is critical about getting, you know, what the, this holiday is emblematic of is that they're getting that America to move forward. Yep. Well, that's so so well put. Um, I I also took away a feeling of deep patriotism. It's kind of a complicated word, mm -hmm. but you know, love of place certainly. Maybe not always love of the government of the United States. That hasn't always you know. Some periods it's better than at other periods, but love of being from Texas. Annette Gordon-Reed is from a small town in Texas. And 
she talks in a very personal way about what Juneteenth was like in her family. Among other things, it's a food holiday. There's a kind of you know set of dishes she and her family would make. It's kind of funny. It's almost as much a Mexican holiday as an American. And the tamales and um, she writes really gorgeously about how how they experienced Juneteenth as as when she was young. But um, I I appreciated the patriotism and the great respect that she shows all Americans as she's concluding the book. She talks about whether she she hopes she has discussed these controversial topics with balance and perspective, and she certainly did. And I can't think of too many uh, historians. I, I mean, th there's just so much in this book. There's a, a lot of history, a lot of personal narrative, but then this great respect for people who might not agree with her at the end. It's, it's just a beautiful, and, and generous book. And it, it really overturns a lot of things I had thought about American history, mm -hmm. including the Alamo, which she talked about growing up in Texas and you, that's you know, one of the seminal stories of Texas history is the embattled defenders of the Alamo who are so courageous, they, they don't leave their posts and they're all killed and she points out with her impeccable research, and among other things, she's a phenomenal researcher. And then her work on Thomas Jefferson in a different context was just a triumph of research. This very famous American president who had a really messed up personal life that no one had ever looked at until she came along and, and really exposed it. But doing the same kind of very high level research with the Alamo, she shows that the Mexicans who were attacking the Alamo, who used to be the bad guys, had abolished slavery in their country and, and in Texas when Texas was a part of Mexico. And the defenders, the Caucasian defenders of the Alamo, who we used to think of as the heroes, were very, invested in the perpetuation of slavery. So a lot of our stories that we receive, including in her case as a child in the Texas public school system, really need to be re-examined. And, and, and her, in her polite way, she's very firm about how important that is. And, and, and this is the point of the racial contract, right? If you remove race, from the story, if you if you ignore the centrality of race, because which is an odd thing to do, given that then race was at the center of everything. But if we continue in the present to er to remove race from the past, then we get confused over bad versus good, who's the hero, who's the enemy, and in fact, what we get to see, like the Jefferson. Um, excavation is the messiness of it all. Historical narratives, his, history is messy. It's yeah, messy, amen. it's complicated, piecing it together, especially when the documentary record tends to reflect the people who were in the dominant position. That's so right. trying to unpack it and make sense of it, if you put race back, into the story, which it's, it was never supposed to be ignored in the first place, because they certainly didn't, right? Um, and she's telling us this. Once you add that element back, it gets confusing. And what a better way to learn and think about the complexity, not just of what justice means in its ideal, but how people lived it, how people enacted it. I think the 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 Texas versus white case is profound in a way of illustrating that we can talk about justice, but if our procedural justice doesn't suit, then what exactly do we have? And if we're to prepare young people as I intend to do for the rest of my life, to go out there in a world and challenge justice as is this the best that we can do they have to be able to grapple with the messiness not just accept and adopt 
um, prepackaged ideas, but they want to learn about the stories. They also need to hear about the stories of agency. And what Gordon Reed is doing beautifully, I, I, I think it's really speaking to what young people today are talking about. They don't want to learn about slavery. They also want to hear about resistance. They want to hear about agency. They want to hear memoir and narrative and the personal details. Because in there, you get at the messiness, but you also get at the complexity of how people lived, how they survived, but also how they thrived. Because what we know today, and I am proof of this, is that people did more than just survive. They built things, they built communities and families, and they had clear senses of their humanity, their personhood, as she speaks to very um, thoroughly and effectively, that personhood has never been lost. And we can't continue to do an injustice by selling young people these um, half-baked historical narratives that don't make room for life and the living that we're all fighting for. Right. Well, I love that. Um, well, I'm trying to think of things to say to Macaulay students. And you've mentioned your passion for John Jay students. And I'm, I'm moved by Annette Gordon-Reed's act of excavation. I think you, you used that word. And she came into a history profession that was pretty well formed and had a lot of settled ideas, especially about the famous people. And merely by being curious, she just was curious and a little bit skeptical, she started to poke around. I'm thinking of her Thomas Jefferson book. She's written a few of them, but she uncovered a, a new world inside of Thomas Jefferson's life that no one ever knew about. And it was um, a world that went deep into all of our contradictions as a people. Um, Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence, but is not committed to offering freedom to members of his own family, his his children by his slave, Sally Hemings. It's an incredible, I mean, you mentioned J.R. Ewing's earlier, and I don't know if we've ever had a better soap opera than just Thomas Jefferson's household, but we only know about it because of the hard research, just reading a lot of books and, and going into the archives and refusing to accept the dominant narrative. And so her persistence as a scholar really opened up our own history for us. So for young people wondering what they can do, scholarship does change things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, the pursuit of truth is important. And I don't mean that just on an ideological sense. Of course, that too. But what we are all here to do is teach the future, the people that take over from us, the skills and tools, the ability to do that. Um, you, you keep mentioning the extraordinary work, but the discipline of it. The, this is a methodical, disciplined work that requires engaging with the community of scholarship that's out there. Um, all of this work is always in conversation with what has come before it. And what is incredibly difficult about um, writing something new is that you have to be even more situated in the work of your discipline or the gaps in your discipline in order to advance that work. So now anybody who's writing about Sally Hemings will have a much easier time right. than the person who did it first. And But there are many firsts still yet to happen. And so what I hope um, people get to see from this, much like the first holiday that's um, commemorating the freedom of enslaved Americans, um, you know, 
my my countries <laughs> two of two of my my three countries have that nations around the world that have holidays commemorating um, the freedom of enslaved Africans. The U.S. did not until this year. That is, yeah, that's amazing. phenomenal. That is phenomenal. Of all places, which the U.S. is iconic for its um, commitment to some of the most vicious forms of slavery and racial brutality ever in history came to this moment this year. The first is always the hardest. And I'd like to think, I'd like to hope that what this opens up, as we see across a lot of institutions right now, my institution um, also is one that's part of a consortium of universities studying slavery. Um, John Jay houses the Northeast uh, Slavery Records Index, um, which is an expansion from the New York Slavery Records Index. And even and in that index is our own college namesake, John Jay, hmm. who was as much an abolitionist as he was an enslaver. He owned 17 slaves, but he also sued um, slave owners on behalf of slaves and was um, key in creating the first free school in New York. Um, so I say all that because when you start to put these first things forward, like a holiday, um, recognizing the importance of freedom for the in formerly enslaved, you then open the door and the commitment on a moral level as well as a policy level and all of the other kinds of things to do something with that. What does this now mean to be a country that recognizes freedom of the formerly enslaved? And I think for a lot of people, that's a very scary thing. Hopefully in the academy, it is not. Hopefully in the academy it is not because we have the unique obligation of being the last educating point for um, future participants in, uh, in the citizenship project. People who form their ideas about what to vote for, uh, how to vote, how to participate, how to professionalize their ideas. And, and, and I'm expecting in CUNY that we're going to do really great things, especially because of who we serve. Um, and many of those students are like me who have multiple um, independence days. You know, I'd like to, I now have three that I get to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do we do with all of this recognition of past injustices and what we can do for the future with that. Thank you, Dara. We, we have a question from Charmaine in the chat. How do we educate K through 12 students on history that's been erased from the history book? Most students do not get this education until higher ed. And it's a wonderful question. It, I don't um, know they get it in higher ed yeah, either, Charmaine. Yeah. I don't think they get that in higher ed. Um, you know, um, most of us were educated by people who earned their degrees um, in the 60s and 70s, where the, the people who taught them, that wasn't in their curriculum either. And so unless, um, you know, the academy is a place of specialists. So unless you specialized in something, and I, and I, I can say this after doing a year of really incredible work with faculty colleagues who wanted to do better for students, they, they are learning things completely brand new. And it's not because of willful ignorance or willful neglect, it was not part of the curriculum. And when you specialize, you focus on one narrow little thing and you don't necessarily feel Uh, and you're focused has been 
civil war, you're just not going to um, speak about uh, other aspects of Ameristry that are not necessarily connected to what your particular focus is. So we really have a lot of work, K through 16, um, K through uh, professional schools and so on, to really think about how we unpack um, uh, white supremacy from all aspects of learning, from the structure of learning, to what we accept, what we credential and say is important, to how it is we teach those things where it's not just, let's say about slavery, but is also about activism, resistance, abolition, and the personal narratives that don't often make it into the official um, uh, documentary record. It, it's a question with many components, but one component is state textbooks, textbooks mm -hmm. of US history, which are usually mandated by state governments. In Texas, one of the biggest states in the country, the second biggest, um, has a lot of influence over how textbooks are, are written. Yeah. And, and we need a better process. We need less politics and just more knowledge, basically, more trust of each other. We're in the middle of a very difficult period. We're not out of it at all. Uh, it was made significantly worse by the last president who found mm. cultural turmoil politically beneficial to him. I mean, I'm not sure it actually was, but his strategy definitely was to stir turmoil. And so near the end of his presidency, there was a 1776 commission, which seemed determined to whitewash anything difficult that ever happened in American history. And that's, that's no way to study history. We need to be courageous and look at our problems as you know, with as much focus as our, our triumphs, that, that's the right way to do history. But we need to get into how states ask, their, ask or require their public K through 12 teachers to teach history. And I mean, they're, they're legally allowed to, to do that, but we need to present our opinions and basically if not shame them, just keep the pressure on to teach history with the greatest respect for all perspectives, but especially the marginalized, because what kind of history mm -hmm. ignores the, the vulnerable? What kind of history just tells us a kind of um, simplistic story of marching from one triumph to another? That isn't a history that prepares us very well for the challenges that are certainly coming in the 21st century. And I think one of the great blessings of this book by Annette Gordon-Reed is it is so moderate and so well argued and so personal. And anyone could read it, including a white Texan who is threatened by Juneteenth will read it as, as you said, Dar, and, and perceive this is another person who loves Texas. And, and I think her reasonable way of arguing is going to do a, a lot of good. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, I've, I've, I've struggled for a long time with trying to understand what people think is at stake with a fully educated public, a fully educated public that's well versed in the rich history of this country and many others able to participate fully in the promise of a free and democratic society, what is at stake? Because we really are in need of um, uh, deep engagement with uh, the way government works, how laws impact our lives and the power and the ability to voice and contribute to that. I mean, a, a, a society where uh, its um, citizens, however you wanna define that, cannot and don't understand how to participate or refuse to is in trouble, is in trouble. So the public education project 
of all of this is really critical at this time and is something that um, the way I see it will have the opportunity to really move things in a different direction, which means giving more people the ability to see what their role is in a society. If you don't see your role, if you don't see a place for yourself and your community and your future, then we, we're all, we all lose from that. And the idea that millions of people, I mean, millions of people experienced enslavement and that this is unknown, <laughs> their experiences are unknown by, by choice, by design, by erasure, should be concerning to every single person. Because if you don't see yourself your place or your understanding of how you came to be. And this is a story for everyone, how you benefit from the things that you do, how you're losing from the things that you do. It is impossible to participate in a conversation about what is next for the nation. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think any of us want to live in a sham, live in a lie. And so when we see things going in circles that we never really move anywhere in some of these conversations, we sh should come back to what it is we put in our education. What is it that we're empowering people to do? If it's to perpetuate narratives that are untrue, then we have to get back to writing that in our public education story. And I think, I think that that moment is upon us, right? Um, the, the last year and a half has been ex especially um, inspiring, but I'd extend it even further back to five, six, seven years of watching young people really demand better for what they're learning. Not better jobs, not better housing, but what they are learning. And that is an extraordinary moment that we should all be thinking about what is our stake in making good on that. It's, couldn't agree more. When you use the word sham, it reminded me of a Lincoln quotation before he was president, where he was just complaining about the way Americans always talked about how free a country they were but then with this enormous carved out exception of, of slavery. And he said, if you expect me to believe both things that we're very free and then we also have slavery, frankly, I would rather live in Russia where they don't talk about freedom at all. They just accept they're not a free country. And I would rather be all that way than to always being told I'm so I'm part of a free country when I'm obviously not. So if we can get closer to a single narrative that includes imperfection and error, but also a, an honest attempt to get at the truth of our complicated people. I think that's that's a good history. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it's interesting to think about um, the importance of telling a story and what it is that we decide is worth um, preserving. What is it, what is worth our memory? What is worth our cultural celebrations? What's worth the centering? And, um, you know, in the example you just gave where there is one, one narrative that we all are supposed to accept and we give in to that. That's one way. There's there's certainly um, many ways that we've seen around the globe that um, different uh, communities have organized themselves. But once you enter into this idea that the people can construct things to govern themselves openly and freely, If you say we the people, then you have to kind of see that all the way through to the end. 
you know, I, um, I saw in the comments from Stephanie that uh, uh, about the sort of faux outrage around critical race theory. I'm going to go back to the point that Charles Mills and Stephanie, if you haven't read The Racial Contract, I would suggest you do. Um, I suggest anyone read it. It's really interesting because we've all learned um, certain ideas and theories about how um, civil society has been organized. But a key piece of all of those ideas is that race has been removed from the conversation. So we, the people, really, um, as Mills is pointing out, is we, the white people, we, the white men. And when um, all of the others have been um, excluded from the idea of who is at the center, creating memories, ideas, a narrative about a society, um, you have choices, you can either go along with that, but the American story has not been that. The American story has been, well, wait a minute, you said, we the people, I'm a people, and I demand to be included in that idea of a people. People are fighting for that, people have died for that, and people have changed that. And critical race theory and other um, concepts around how perspective, how um, inclusion, how um, uh, discourse, how truths are written, understood, laws, institutions, and so on, we have to we have to teach people how to engage with these ideas. It's actually a founding principle of the country, engaging with ideas and concepts. And if the nation is going to stand it for the principles that it says are important, then it has to be able to expand to those ideas. Otherwise the concept of we the people cannot remain. And, I, and I'm sure many people are, are concerned about that, but what the last few hundred years of deep, deep activism and resistance has shown is that we, the people, continues to expand to voices of many, many, many people. And critical race theory is important in that, as are a number of other things, because race is central to the founding of the nation and the construction of all of the institutions that are critical to the country, right? So, um, you know, it, it's it's going to be, Stephanie, one of those things that people continue to do. They have to keep pushing back on this idea that the dominant narrative has to stand. It does not, and it will not, maybe not um, in the time of my child, but certainly it is moving in a way that is profoundly different from the way I was educated and the way my current students are being educated. And hopefully in another generation, this will be a thing like celebrating Martin Luther King Day, where the, the movement around it is very different from where people are decades later. There was a good column, I believe today, in the New York Times by Michelle Goldberg about critical race theory. And she said, it's a depressing thing, but it's pretty easy for us all to believe that it's been an extremely effective slogan for the Republican Party to attack much more than, and I'm, I'm not, I'm a Democrat, but I, I'm not trying to in, engage too much in recent politics, but um, it's a successful polemical strategy on the part of the right to attack critical race theory. I think all three of those words are threatening to, to white supremacists. And there isn't really a huge effort anywhere to promote critical race theory. It just, it's just, it, it was a kind of body of thinking in law schools. It came out of Harvard Law a certain amount of time ago, but it's been very effective as a polemic against this new kind of inclusive history. It's, it's just sort of an alarmist way of ringing all these bells and getting people worried. Um, and 
I think the sooner we can get past the, the tension over critical race theory.